I need to begin this video with a brief explanation. Several new subscribers have found my channel recently and I'd like to welcome you to this musical adventure. It's nice to have you along for the ride. Since I can't know what kind of musical background you have and whether or not the language I'm using in my analyses is familiar, it seems to me a good thing to revisit that language and try to pin its particulars to some familiar music so that you'll understand better what I'm saying. For those of you who already have deep familiarity with this way of looking at music, it may still be that some of my ways of explaining it are different from other approaches you've heard, so there may be some benefit for you in what I'm up to here. This little serenade, that's exactly what the title Eine kleine Nachtmusik means, provides some exceptionally clear examples of sonata, rondo, minuet, and sonata rondo forms. And if you understand how those forms work in these very modest musical examples, you'll be in a much better position to understand how those same forms work in the much larger proportioned serious music of Mozart's generation and beyond. This little G major serenade was written in 1787, when the 31-year-old composer was living in Vienna. It comes from a very productive period in his life, appearing between the Prague Symphony, written a year earlier, and the Great Final Three, a product of the following year. The work has, superficially, a symphonic shape, with its four-movement plan analogous to that of the final symphonies. But that's just an accident of history, because Eine Kleine Nachtmusik originally had five movements, the standard shape of Mozart's party music. And the missing movement would have been an additional minuet movement appearing after movement one. That is to say, the work would have had the overall shape of a formal palindrome. Since that one movement has been lost, the resulting four-movement work retains the tonal shape that we might expect of a symphony in G major. Thus, the opening movement is set in the tonic key, the second movement is in the contrasting subdominant key, C major, which in context has a somewhat warmer sound, and then the final two movements return us to the tonic key. This macrocosm, establishing a tonic key, departing from it, and returning to it, is reflected within the individual movements, and that is what their formal plans are all about. That is to say, sonata form, for instance, is not some kind of musical vessel into which one pours tunes, but is instead the natural product of the act of departing from and returning to an established tonic key. Another way of putting it is that each of the four movements starts here, goes there, and comes back here. That is the essence of classical form. And it might be said that, generally speaking, the seriousness of the intent of the music is directly proportional to the span of time over which this departure and return are worked out. Let's take up the movements individually and see what they have to teach us about musical form. In this video, you'll be treated to a recording of a live performance by the Marlboro Festival Orchestra under the baton of Pablo Casals, made in 1967. Some of you might find this treatment a little heavy-handed. This is, after all, music that was intended as a pleasant background for soirees, and here it's rendered very seriously by a perhaps inappropriately large and somewhat under-rehearsed orchestra. This performance really does honor the music, however, by taking the music as seriously as it does and exhibits the virtue of observing almost all of the repeats, which is necessary for an understanding of musical form. If you're interested in pursuing this, you can find this performance on the Sony Classical label, together with Mozart's two excellent serenades for wind octet. The first movement is in sonata form. Sonata form evolved during the second half of the 18th century from the two-part dance forms that were popular in the first half of that century, well represented in such works as J.S. Bach's orchestral suites, which are collections of such two-part dances. In those binary forms, the first part makes some kind of harmonic journey. 
If the dance is in a major key, that journey will probably be from tonic to dominant. In the case of minor key dances, tonic to mediant, or relative major, is more common. One of the conventions of such dances is that the aphor described first part is repeated, so that your ear can make that harmonic journey again. The second part of the dance answers the first part by taking up the thread of the harmonic argument, usually by playing around with that secondary key a little, and then returning the music to the tonic for closure. The second part is also repeated. What I've just described is exactly what you see in some of my analyses when I identify a minuet movement as minuet in two repeated strains. That overall plan remains in force when the form is expanded so as to represent the secondary tonal area, the dominant or mediant, by a distinct theme or collection of themes. The dramatic possibilities inherent in such an approach are probably obvious. Such an expansion of the form's first part makes a corresponding enlargement of the second part necessary for the purpose of formal balance, and that accounts for the development and return, the returning including all of the exposition's material but in the tonic key, which represents the ultimate reconciliation more or less required by enlightenment ideals to which this music gives voice. What I've just described is sonata form in a nutshell. A coda may or may not be appended to lend the movement a formally satisfying ending. This is largely a factor of seriousness of intent. In order to try to make all of this as clear as I can make it, I'm going to present the opening movement twice in this video. The first time through, I'll furnish a narrative. The music will probably be sufficiently familiar that the narrative will elucidate the music rather than distract you from it. That, at least, is my hope. So let's dive right in and see how this works.
For our second trip through this movement, I'll return to my more usual approach, presenting the score of the work along with some cryptic commentary focusing on the music structure, including an accounting of the harmonic journey that I just talked you through. I'd recommend that you devote most of your attention to Mozart's printed notes, following the contours they set forth as though you were reading a painting from left to right. As you follow the music's contours and ins and outs, let your eye and ear guide each other to interesting features that might go unnoticed with a simple auditing. Use my comments only as markers on your musical journey. See if that works. And keep in mind that great art, even in such modest guise as this, invites and rewards repeated examination. <laughs>
As I mentioned earlier, the original second movement of this work has been lost. The usual plan for such garden party music as this would have called for a minuet movement at this point, about the same length and weight as the third of the extant four movements, perhaps set in a contrasting key. We go now to what would have been the central movement of a five-movement work, a romance in rondo form set in the work's subdominant key. That is to say, the F-sharp of G major has been dropped in favor of the F-natural of C major, resulting in a somewhat darker and arguably warmer sound. I will present this and subsequent movements only once. Pure rondo form was a feature of earlier 18th century composition, and Mozart has given us a fairly pure late 18th century example of music in that form, with one exceptional feature that I will note as the music unfolds. The pure form is simply this, a harmonically closed theme that serves as a refrain set in the tonic key, begins the movement, and then returns several times during its course. In between those statements lie contrasting episodes that visit keys other than the tonic, a very common plan that results from this approach could be diagrammed A, B, A, C, A, with A representing the refrain and B and C the contrasting episodes. 
The plan can be expanded, as in J.S. Bach's E Major Violin Concerto, whose final movement takes the plan A, B, A, C, A, D, A, E, A. Mozart's plan in this movement is that simpler A, B, A, C, A pattern, albeit with a twist. The middle appearance of the refrain actually occurs during the second episode's second repeated strain, thus sounded twice, and it is an abbreviated appearance. I believe my meaning will become clear as we go through the music. One final word. The music's rhythmic profile is that of the gavotte, which is to say that the refrain begins on the third beat of a four-beat measure and its phrasing runs from mid-bar to mid-bar. This means that the repeat signs will divide affected measures into two equal parts. Be prepared for that.
the extant minuet movement returns us to the tonic key. This short movement is not at all like the symphonic minuets of Mozart and Haydn. If you were to compare this movement to the corresponding movement of Mozart's Jupiter Symphony, written a year later, you'd no doubt be struck by how different they are. This movement is more like the dance music that Mozart cranked out by the ream for the dance studios of Vienna. That activity, in which Mozart took little pleasure, guaranteed a portion of the composer's always uncertain income. The music takes on the almost stultifying regularity of eight-bar harmonically closed sections. Its trio is in the next brighter key of D major, a key we've encountered before, and which represents a sunnier foil to the darker sounds of C major, which served as the harmonic platform for movement two. Initially, the minuet form of Mozart's day represented a refinement of the approach taken by members of Bach's generation, in which dance movements were often set forth in related pairs, with a return to the first of those paired movements after the presentation of the second. The second of those pairs was often set in a contrasting key and played by reduced forces, often two trebles and a bass, hence trio. The name stuck. This movement's overall harmonic trajectory from G major through D major and back to G corresponds to the overall journey we enjoyed in movement one, and which will also shape the final movement. Maestro Casals' decision not to observe the minuet's repeats during the Da Capo reprise, while certainly conventional, strikes me as unfortunate, resulting in a movement that feels formally unbalanced. What do you think? <laughs> Four is identified by Mozart as a rondo, but we have to remember that that term had taken on a somewhat different meaning by the late 18th century, thanks largely to Joseph Haydn's pioneering work in that hybrid approach usually known nowadays as sonata rondo. The present movement is a particularly interesting example owing to the fact that both large sections are repeated, as in movement one. The result is a sonata form movement with a somewhat rondo-like flavor. That impression is generated by Mozart's use of his first theme, which also serves as a refrain. That theme is originally presented twice in G major, and then is treated to a very full return in D major in a second theme context. 
That theme also begins the development section in the movement's flat submediant key, E flat major, and since the second large section is repeated, we will hear that treatment twice. The theme does not return at the beginning of the recap as we might have expected, but since the second group does return in the tonic key as per the accepted formula, and that second group initially included a D major statement of the main theme during the exposition, this means that the first theme actually does get a very full tonic key treatment in a recapitulation that may strike you as out of order, but really isn't. The refrain is given a proper reprise at the beginning of the G major coda, and it is that appearance of the first theme that really clenches the rondo aspect of this most unusual hybrid. Be sure to notice the kinship between the opening of this movement's refrain and the arpeggiation of the G major tonic chord in plagal position that opened movement one. I want only to mention that the exposition of this movement includes an internal repeat of the main theme, which will involve a perhaps disconcertingly rapid page turn shortly after the movement's beginning. In this recording, that repeat is not observed when the exposition is repeated, and I think that's a mistake in judgment. It seems to me that an exposition repeat, by definition, should present the exposited material a second time exactly as we heard it the first time. I don't mean to quibble, and I certainly intend no arrogant comparison of stature with Pablo Casals, but the purest streak in the atheist codger is strong and will have its say from time to time. Thank you. 
Thank you.